Oh, hello, everybody, and welcome to our lecture on human adaptation, skin tone, and thermoregulation. Um, so now we're going to start, you know, we kind of talked a little bit last week about, uh, you know, the very basics of evolution, gave you a little bit of background on the forces of evolution, and I gave you a little bit of background on the um, genetics behind it, right? So I don't want you guys to worry, we're not, this class is not going to be focusing on specific genes and things like that. I will mention a few um, just for our own edification, but what I want us to focus on is these broad patterns in human adaptation that we're going to discuss, right? And the two big one that we're going to focus in this lecture on is skin tone and thermoregulation, right? Why do we have, as modern humans, differences in skin tone, right? And how do we adapt to uh, differences in temperature, right? Because, you know, we all know that we can't run around outside naked, even in the, you know, kind of even in the summertime, sometimes it gets a little chilly, right? So humans themselves were not really adapted for every single climate, right? We've had to kind of use this whole notion of culture with a little bit of tweaking of our biology in order to adapt to the wide variety of environments and climates that we exist in today. So what we're getting at here is in something in anthropology that we call the biocultural approach, right? So we're really looking at the intersection of culture and biology, right? How does culture affect biology and vice versa, right? How do humans adapt to various environments, right? We essentially seek to explain morphological and physiological differences among humans, right? Really all that's saying is we're really seeking to explain why do humans as members of a single species look so different on the outside from one another, right? When we look at other animal species, you know, every emperor penguin, even though they're far more genetically variable than the human species, they all look the same, right? There's very little variation between one male emperor penguin versus another male emperor penguin. But for humans, we have all sorts of differences in terms of our size and our outward appearance, right? We're going to talk a little bit about uh, polytypic variation, as well as um, what uh, traits that we have benefit us reproductively. So like do traits or do these adv ad adaptations uh, benefit us in terms of reproduction and kind of, you know, a bit of a spoiler alert, they do, right? Because that's really the name of the game in evolution and really the name of the game in adaptation in general, right? You're trying to make yourself better fit for the environment in order to be more successful in surviving and reproducing. So when we look at studies in physiology, when they address adaptation, it can be used in several ways. It can be referring to a state of being well adapted to an environment, being well suited to exist in an environment. Uh, it could also refer to a trait or characteristic that is thought to enhance uh, the survival or reproductive value of a specific organism, right? So essentially, we're looking for anything that increases our fitness, right, as a species in a given environment. So that would be any adaptation, right? So any increase in fitness could potentially result from an adaptation. And why are we adapting, right? Why do humans have to use culture and biological mechanisms to adapt to the environment? Well, what we're really doing is responding to different stresses that the environment places on us, right? So stress can be internal factors like disease. It can be external factors like environment. But basically, we're anything um, in, in a physiological study, anything that disrupts homeostasis is considered stress, right? So an example, exercise causes thirst in you, and you uh, to regain the balance of fluids and ion concentrations, you begin to uh, drink water, right? So in essence, your body is responding to the stress of dehydration. Along with stress comes strain, right? And really strain is kind of our measurement on how we uh, really put a um, gauge on how, how to define how intense stress is, right? So really a strain refers to the intensity of stress, the scale to measure homeostatic disruption, right? And we usually use temperature as a point of measure, right? When we all learn about homeostasis in kind of our basic biology classes, we learn that um, homeostasis refers specifically to our temperature, right? And if we have a fever, that's disrupting our homeostasis. But in terms of overall physiology, genetics, and human biology in general, 
homeostasis can refer to a lot of different things, right? It's really just a disruption in the status quo, right? So we can have things like glucose homeostasis. We can have, um, like we talked about with exercise and thirst, you can have ion and fluid homeostasis. You also have things like salt or sodium homeostasis within your blood, right? So there are different forms of homeostasis. Um, so really in terms of how we define it in this class, we're gonna define homeostasis as simply just the status quo for everything in your body to run normally. So going along with what I just said, right? So homeostasis is not just related to temperature. It relates to the maintaining of function in all cells, right? It's in maintaining an internal balance in spite of external stressor uh, factors. So a good example of this is glucose homeostasis. And I believe the next slide gives you a um, example of the kind of uh, glucose cycle and how that homeostasis is maintained. Some physiology studies will uh, focus on kind of the genetic end of adaptation, right? Because um, a lot of adaptations that are in a lot of response that we have to um, environmental stressors over time will lead to um, an adaptation via genetics, right? And uh, we do this using something called the molecular clock, right? Which looks at single genes and it traces the number of mutations in that gene, right? And the very first mutation should be when that gene first arose within our uh, gene pool, right? So we can actually kind of trace, um, if, if we can prove that it's a gen genetic adaptation, we can actually trace how far or um, how long that genetic adaptation has been within our species using this molecular clock. So the molecular clock um, kind of follows some basic principles that the rate of evolution of DNA is constant over time and across uh, lineages since DNA is essentially the same across all species um, in terms of its basic construction. Uh, we resolve history of species. You know, we can find the timing of events or the relationship between species when different species diverge from one another. Um, early protein studies showed approximately a constant rate of evolution, right? So we know that these mutations happen at a fairly constant rate. So if we're able to, uh, if we know that, we can trace those mutations back to when they first occurred within the genetic pool. The genetic clock can also um, alter timelines for us, right? If we look at just fossil evidence, it would tell us that birds are at least 62 to 66 million years ago. But when we trace the actual genetic adaptations for uh, bird species, we find that according to the molecular clock, birds could have arose as, um, as late as 75 to as early as 160 million years ago. If we use an example from our own species of um, just looking at this concept of the molecular clock, we know that mutations in the FOXP2 gene are what dictate speech in humans as well as call ability in other animals, right? If we look at uh, song uh, birds, they have a wide vocal range. They evolved from a prehistoric set of birds with a mutation in the FOXP2 gene at around 64 million years ago. If we look at humans, we differ from non-human primates by the substitution of two amino acids, right, at position 303, and the substitution of a serine at position 325, right? And what this does is it regulates the repeat-containing protein, which is an X-linked 2 protein. It's called SRPX2, which is an epilepsy and language-associated gene in humans and also a sound-controlling gene in mice. And we know that this mutation occurred roughly 1.5 million years ago in our kind of lineage right and that Neanderthals have this mutation too right so we're, we're not saying that this is when language developed but this is when the kind of neurological structures or the genetic structures that allowed for the processing of language to um, occur right so it could have occurred shortly after this it could have occurred at or around 1.5 million years we're just not 100 percent sure right because genetics itself does not determine language development but language uh con consequently uh changes much like genes do um, from gener one generation to the next so there are two main categories of adaptations that we're going to talk about in this class, right? Of course, we're going to talk about cultural adaptations, things like uh, housing, things like clothing, uh, cultural practices that uh, allow better adaptation to the environment or increased fitness. We're also going to talk about biological adaptations, right? 
And what we're really going to get by the end of this class is, um, you know, culture uh, persists in our species as an extra somatic means of adaptation, right? It is our way of adapting to the environment without having to go through the long and arduous process of genetic change, right? Because we all know from our lectures last week that in terms of making substantial evolutionary change, it takes many, 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 many generations for that to occur, right? So we really need this cultural aspect or this kind of cultural mechanism in order for us to make rapid changes to the rapidly changing uh, environment. So if we look at these kind of different types of adaptations, we have uh, genetic adaptations, right? We're gonna talk about something uh, called the a uh, sickle cell trait, essentially um, in Africa, uh, there's a high incidence of malaria infections. Malaria is a very um, devastating parasite in humans, um, in essence, and uh, we have a slight genetic uh, adaptation to that, right? Um, but if you inherit two copies of that gene, you end up getting sickle cell anemia, which um, is a deleterious disease. But if you only inherit one copy of that gene from a parent, it makes you slightly resistant to the malaria parasite. We also have developmental adaptations like physical changes to the environment. We're going to talk about your nose and your face and your sinus cavities. All of those are shaped by the environment much more prevalently than your genetics. Uh, we have a climatization, right, which can occur any time during life, right? We're going to talk about this when we talk about moving from low to high altitudes. And, of course, we have cultural adaptations, things like marriage systems and governments and uh, cultural patterns, right? And essentially all of these are functional adaptations, right, because they provide a function to our species in terms of increasing our fitness within a given environment. So when we talk about cultural adaptations, right, this is our uh, using technology as a means to maintain homeostasis, right? So essentially, uh, for if we use temperature as an example, it's uh, using clothing or fire or shelter in order to maintain your uh, temperature homeostasis, right? So culture acts as our way of adapting to the external environment. The use of fire dates to at or around uh, 400,000 years ago. It's actually much earlier than that now. Um, that date is constantly being revised. Um, so don't worry, I'm not going to test you on dates in this class because uh, that's one of the beauties of uh, archaeology and prehistory, right? Because we are always finding new evidence that helps us revise our ideas about the past. But currently we have uh, caves in South Africa that show ash layers and burnt animal bones that date to around 400 to 450. 50,000 years ago, and fire is used in basically every single human environment, right? We use fire in hot zones as well for, you know, for cooking. Uh, we use fire in uh, temperate zones for heating and cooking, um, and our method of using fire may vary, right? Even in these really cold Arctic regions, like you can see in the photo featured in the bottom right, um, we can we find ways to use fire, right? There actually is no wood up in these Arctic regions because it's above the tree line, right? There's no trees that grow up there. So essentially they you have made these kind of technological little furnaces and candles and cooking implements using um, seal blubber and animal fat as their source of energy or the, as their um, fuel. This is just showing you uh, just some of the variety of homes that we see um, in various cultures, whether you're looking at kind of a uh, yurka hut in the top right here, or you're looking at a kind of floating river home uh, that's featured right below it. There are all sorts of different homes, and each home is constructed um, with the environment in mind, right? And uh, the home essentially is really constructed with the idea of temperature in mind, right? Some homes are built more uh, with a open format in hotter regions. Um, as a matter of fact, in Polynesia, a lot of the times your homes won't even have walls, right? Because you want as much airflow going through the home as possible. Um, in more temperate or colder regions, you're going to have homes that have walls that have multiple layers with insulation in between, right, to keep that cold air out and to kind of help you maintain your homeostasis. <laughs> 
So the next couple slides are going to show you just the uh, variety of different um, homes that we see in the extremes. Here we have an Inuk dwelling from um, the Arctic Circle in Canada, right? So as you can see, this is kind of our classic igloo. And the next couple slides will show you um, actually how they make these uh, igloos. It's kind of a circular construction, and it's all really meant uh, and built to kind of keep as much heat inside of that uh, igloo as possible. Here we can see a Yanomami uh, tribal village in Brazil. And you can see um, it's got a very large circular construction and there are no side walls on the homes, right? Essentially, it's just basically a large um, uh, tent, essentially with uh, beams and a thatch roofing. And this is all done to kind of, uh, one, give them protection from the sun, but two, also keep as much open as possible so that they can get as much breeze as possible because they are living in a tropical rainforest. This is a um, picture of a Yanomami village in the highlands, right? Up in the highlands, it's a little bit drier, it's a little bit colder than it is down in kind of the actual rainforest. So you can see that the construction is built a little bit closer to the ground. You have actually a little more um, coverage in terms of the uh, thatch roofing, right? And that's all done because, you know, the temperatures there are a little bit colder, right? So you can see that we make slight modifications to our cultural dwellings based on um, what the temperature is outside, right? All of this is a, a response to environmental stresses and pressures. So now that we talked a little bit about cultural adaptations like clothing, technology, and um, shelter, let's look a bit at our biological adaptations, right? So genetic adaptations are present in, in every entire uh, species. So an example in humans would be our ability to sweat, right? All humans, except for um, some that are born with specific genetic conditions, um, have the ability to sweat to cool our bodies down, right? The efficacy of sweating uh, may vary between populations, but all humans have this basic ability. So whereas we all have um, these base genetic adaptations like sweating, we also have adaptations that are are traits within us that are heavily influenced by the environment, right? Um, skin tone is actually something that in a given individual's lifetime can be heavily influenced by the environment, right? It's so essentially the amount of UV exposure that you get. So what we refer to this as kind of this phenotypic plasticity, right? The ability to kind of change or slightly alter our outward appearance. So this kind of really refers to the observable physiological responses to our environments. Looking at another type of biological adaptation here, we have acclimatization. This is a reversible process. Um, an example of this that we'll kind of talk about a little bit later are changes in cardiovascular output when a lowlander moves into high altitude. It is possible that phenotypic changes during development, uh, if you're talking about a phenotypic change that occurs um, very, very early in life or even during kind of fetal development, um, those may in fact become irreversible, right? This is known as developmental acclimatization. Um, an example of this is people who live permanently at high altitudes like our Tibetan and Andean natives, right? And each of those groups comes with a distinct set of physiological and genetic adaptations that allow them to live at high altitude. And we'll, we'll talk about that um, in another lecture. So what was our first, uh, as a species, our first major physiological adaptation, right? So all human mitochondrial DNA we know traces back to Africa, essentially in eastern Ethiopia, at or about 180,000 years ago, right? And we actually have uh, this date pushed back a little bit further based on research that came out uh, about a month and a half ago that puts this at about two, uh, 280,000 years ago. Uh, one major uh, physiological adaptation allowed for our people essentially to spread from that little area in Eastern Africa to the rest of the world, right? Something that is quite unique to humans. Marathon running. We as a species are um, one of the only species that has endurance. Yes, we are not the fastest. Your dog and even your cat and even a squirrel will outrun you every single time, right? Because four legs are far more, uh, you know, in terms of speed are far better than two legs. What those animals do not have is endurance. They cannot keep 
that pace going, right? It is because you as a human have that efficient uh, sweating system that helps you cool down. And because of your bipedal uh, locomotion, right, that is what really allows us to have that endurance that allows us to run and be able to sustain, um, us, you know, albeit lower speeds uh, over longer distances. And what evidence do we have of this kind of major physiological adaptation or the importance of it? Well, you, all you have to do is look at your bottom, right? Your gluteus maximus muscle, right? It's one of the largest muscles in your uh, body. It rarely fires during your regular walking, right? You're what we call your bipedal gait phase. Um, this is just really a fancy way of saying your normal walking. So when you're walking, your gluteus maximus muscle rarely fires, but it fires rapidly during running, right? So humans are the only creatures capable of sustained running, and we have the physiological adaptations to show it. So let's take a look at human phenotypic variation, right? How do we vary on the outside, right? And the first thing we're gonna look at is facial features. We know that the prominence of the nose um, is an ancestral adaptation to humidity, right? So wherever your ethnic ancestors came from, what the environment was like, the levels of humidity will actually alter a uh, person's nose or a uh, population's nose over a given period of time, right? So after successive generations of living in a moist or humid uh, environment, that's going to have a dramatic effect on the size and shape of the noses of the people who are living in that area. So the nose is highly susceptible to environmental forces, right? Uh, essentially humidity and temperature. The more humidity, the shorter and wider your nose is gonna be, right? European populations tend to have longer, thinner noses as well as desert people have longer, thinner noses, right? But people in South America and people who live in uh, very, very humid climates tend to have shorter, wider noses. So in essence, you know, looking at your nose, and uh, we'll talk about skin tone here shortly, um, we have this wide variety of responses to these very extreme pressures that we deal with, right? Humans as a species, because we have moved to every uh, potential environment on the planet, we deal with extreme heat and extreme cold. We either deal with an overabundance or a scarcity of UV radiation or ultraviolet radiation. We deal with, uh, low, we actually have gone even to low oxygen environments such as high altitudes, right? So humans as the species have really, over the course of our uh, evolutionary existence, have adapted quite a bit to the wide variety of environments that the planet offers. So this is the ancient thermal map showing you um, kind of temperature maximums around the time that our species evolved, right? And if we really look at that kind of Eastern Africa area, we can see that it was kind of, it wasn't exactly cool and it wasn't exactly super warm. It was uh, more kind of on the temperate to warmer side, right? So we as a species are really adapted to kind of live between uh, 75 and 90 degrees uh, comfortably. So, like all homeothermic mammals, uh, humans must maintain an internal body temperature within a very, very narrow range, right? Our metabolic processes within our body, of course, generate heat, right? All of that biochemical activity um, generates energy, right? And that energy comes off in the form of heat. And this can be either retained um, to conserve heat or to dissipate it to get rid of it. Um, deep body temperature must be maintained very close to a 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit, right? And this will actually vary from individual to individual, right? We recently found out in the past few years that this uh, kind of static number of 98.6 degrees really isn't uh, uniform across all human populations. Um, in essence, you get a little bit of variation within about two degrees um, on both sides. So you get people who are actually much cooler and you get people who are much warmer. I know myself, I actually average out to around uh, 98.3 instead of 98.6 degrees. 
So when we look at studies in physiology that look at kind of this interaction between uh, biochemical activity and energy and heat, what we're really looking at is basal metabolic rate, right? And BMR is measured after 12 to 24 hours of fasting and in a resting state, right? So essentially what you're doing is trying to put this individual into their lowest rate of biochemical activity, right? Just the bare minimum to keep your body going, right? BMR, of course, is measured in kilocalories. So at rest, the energy produces enough metabolic heat to replace the body heat that's lost to the environment. The basal state enables all necessary biochemical reactions to continue with minimal energy expenditure while maintaining normal body temperature, right? So in essence, what really what we're looking at here is a better basal metabolic rate is the lowest level of activity where you're still able to maintain that balance between losing heat to the environment and producing heat within your body. So this is showing you uh, essentially that um, your basal metabolic uh, resting rate will go up in kilocalories per day the higher your um, body weight is. That's why it can become very difficult for people to um, essentially lose weight, right? Because you end up becoming having that higher caloric load before you even are able to kind of overload the system to begin burning and losing weight. Um, and really what this graph also kind of shows you is that humans in general between quote unquote races um, are very clustered very closely together. Right, so in essence, there really is not much difference in terms of BMR between uh, different populations of humans, right? The, the differences are really kind of negligible in terms of uh, overall averages. So we know that metabolic rates are greatly affected by the environment, right? And they're greatly affected by temperature, right? So food itself will greatly affect BMI, right? So foods are chosen based on what is best for maintaining temperature homeostasis within a specific environment. As an example, tropical diets contain high carbohydrate foods, low fat foods, low energy foods, um, things like plant, plantains, manioc, bananas, and fish, because tropical people don't have the same BMR requirement as people who live in temper, temperate or uh, colder regions, right? They have lower basal metabolic rates than those living in uh, colder or temperate regions, right? So really the big difference that we see between human populations in terms of basal, basal metabolic rates is really in terms of temperature, right? Not in terms of uh, strictly genetics. So if we look at our basic human response to heat, we have uh, this process of vasodilation, right, which increases our blood volume in our peripheral circulatory system to bring more of that deep body heat to the surface. So essentially what we're doing is we're flushing the surface of our, 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 our arterial system with blood in order to kind of dissipate heat off of our skin. 67% uh, of the heat you generate is simply radiated out of your body. Uh, evaporation of sweat accounts for another 23%. And 10% uh, is simply lost through airflow convection. We also have another interesting mechanism within our bodies that allow for temperature homeostasis, this notion of countercurrent heat exchange. Um, so in uh, humans and a lot of other uh, mammalian animals, um, we are basically how the uh, picture at the top is featured, right? Our arterial and vein systems run closely together so they can exchange heat uh, with one another, so it can either uh, cool or heat as needed um, as blood is coming in and out of your um, system, right? Uh, some other animals uh, have a non-countercurrent heat exchange, and those animals are generally more susceptible to environmental temperature extremes than uh, some mammalians and humans. So notice the blood is being distributed away from the core of the person um, because essentially you're trying to get rid of heat, right? So if you look at the image on the right or the kind of little uh, bubble here on the right, it's showing you that in vasodilation, you have these little control mechanisms in your arterial system that open up and allow more blood to flush towards the skin, right? And allows that blood to be cooled as it moves across the, uh, just beneath the skin layers and you end up losing heat, right? So that helps you cool off much more efficiently. If you look at the bubble on the left there, the one listed A, um, those same mechanisms can also go the opposite way. When you are cold and you need to conserve heat, those, uh, you'll actually constrict those little vessels and you'll keep more of that warm blood towards your organs, which are the kind of important functioning uh, bodies within your uh, system. So another way in which we deal with um, 
heat as a species is with sweating, right? And sweating in humans is very efficient because we are, as a species, relatively hairless. We can sweat upwards to a liter an hour. And some hypothesize that sweating in combination with selective pressure brought on by body lice is why we lost our body hair, right? So in essence, it became more advantageous for us to be more hairless as we were moving around these hot environments in Africa um, than it was to kind of try and conserve heat, right? So as we began to move on two legs, this kind of sweat system uh, kind of developed and um, really kind of uh, kick-started that process of losing our body hair. Also, sweating is very efficient in cooling your brain. And as your brain size increases, um, it becomes more susceptible for heat, right? So as a species in our evolutionary history, as our brain size increased, we needed a better uh, cooling system in order to kind of keep our brain function at homeostasis. And we all know how the human brain and heat works, right? We all know that when it's really, really hot outside, you can feel a little bit sluggish and you might have a little bit difficulty in some problem solving, right? Because our cognitive abilities decline sharper the hotter we get. If we look at a quote from a researcher named Silk who looked at the um, evolutionary consequences of heat and brain size, he says, with an increased brain size, the importance of having a hardworking and efficient whole body cooling system comes into play more than ever before. Behind every large human brain, there is a potentially very sweaty human body. Okay, so let's look at uh, human response to cold, right? So we looked at our response to heat, which is essentially vasodilation. We flood more blood into our peripheral system in order to cool off. We sweat as a response to heat, right? We lost a lot of our body hair over our evolutionary history as a response to dealing with heat. So let's look at how um, we physiologically deal with the cold, right? Our immediate physiological response, of course, we all know this is shivering, right? Because working muscles gives off a great deal of heat. We also have vasoconstriction, right? I talked about that when I showed that slide um, about vasodilation, right? So when we're cold, those same mechanisms that open up when we're hot will close when we're cold, right? Conserving more of that warm blood towards the center of our body. Um, archaeological evidence currently suggests that fires began in earnest around 400 to 450,000 years ago um, with ancient hearths, earth ovens, burnt animal bones, and burnt flint appearing across Europe and the Middle East. We do have a couple interesting uh, genetic adaptations that have occurred in human populations that have been exposed to cold temperatures for uh, successive generations, right? And we call this uh, cold-induced vasodilation, right? It's actually this rhythmic alternation of constriction and dilation of the vascular system. And the net result of this is slower temperature loss in the extremities for these people who live in Arctic conditions, right? So this is an adaptation to cold cold stress on fingers and toes, right? So essentially what we believe is that these polar people, these Inuit, these Eskimo people uh, living in, uh, above the Arctic Circle in these perpetually cold temperatures, they developed this system because, well, they were dealing with the environmental pressure of their fingers and toes were getting frostbite over you know, generation after generation after generation. So they evolved this adaptation that allowed them to kind of slightly alter the way their arterial system and their blood system works within their body and kind of uh, constrict and dilate in this rhythmic motion that allows for um, just enough of that warm blood to stay in those fingers and toes to keep them from getting frostbite. We also have some unique phenotypic plasticity that we see in Korea. We have these ama divers who shiver at much lower temperatures than their non-diving Korean uh, compatriots, right? And we realize that their metabolic heat production is actually 35% higher than other uh, Korean women and men. And this is a cold adaptive response because these uh, ama divers repeatedly dive in these very, very cold ocean waters in search of um, shellfish as well as pearls um, and other kind of ocean treasures, right? So when we look at all of life on the planet in general, in terms of multicellular complex organisms, we notice some general patterns, right? And in humans in particular, this pattern is very, very prevalent, right? It's something known as Bergman and Allen's rule. 
right? So in essence, this is looking at the volume of the organism versus the surface area of the organism, right? So if we look at the volume of an organism, this reflects mass and is proportional to the amount of heat generated. If we look at the surface area of an organism, it's how much heat an organism can exchange, loss versus gain, right? So the prediction is that natural selection should prefer heavy animals with relatively small surface areas for colder climates. So if you have a high volume, low surface area, you are cold adapted. If you have a low volume but high surface area, you are heat adapted. So how does this really work in um, what we see in the actual uh, animal kingdom as well as in the fossil record? Well, if we go back to the ice ages, uh, the Pleistocene, we know that the body size of many mammals increased as the climate became colder, right? This is known as Carl Bergman's rule, right? So this is Bergman's rule. Bigger, broader bodies can be found in colder climates, right? So Bergman's rule accounts for the directional selection we see in these megafauna. So we know that it goes the same uh, with J.A. Allen's rules. He says that the appendages are going to be shorter in colder climates and longer in hot climates, right? If we look at our San Bushman from warmer Africa, right, we know that he is very thin and tall, right, because the temperature is warmer. If we look at our Native American from Canada, he in colder temperature, he's shorter, stockier, and his appendages are shorter, right? So the basic rule that we see in terms of Bergman and Allen's rule is that we're in the cold, we're going to find broader bodies with shorter appendages, and in the heat, we're going to find taller uh, bodies with uh, longer appendages. And what this all relates back to is our kind of uh, neutral thermal range as humans, right? So at uh, rest, a uh, nude subject can achieve thermal balance, heat gain versus heat loss at ambient temperatures between 77 to 80 degrees Fahrenheit. That is a uh, not a very big uh, neutral range for our species, right? So below this range, your heat generating mechanisms are going to increase, and the network of blood vessels below the skin will constrict, uh, right? We talked about that passive constriction, which is reducing your heat loss, right? Metabolic uh, rate will increase to compensate for body heat loss, right? And if you go above that range, the exact opposite of those mechanisms will occur, right? So in terms of polar people and diets, right, polar diets are high in protein and fat because polar people have higher BMRs, right? So they require higher quality fats and higher quality proteins in order to maintain that basic homeostasis. And in a lot of cases, they get these from things like uh, seals. Uh, many fish species um, kind of in the Arctic region are also uh, very good sources of high quality fats and proteins for the polar people with higher BMRs. Now that we've talked about uh, human adaptations in terms of diet and uh, physiological adaptations for heat and cold, let's look at what happens in between, right? Our temperate zone adaptations, right? These are perhaps our most cultural, right? In terms of we see animal skin clothing, the use of fires or communal sleeping beds uh, to maintain heat. Uh, we have humans that are under uh, habituation, right? And habituation is the redu reduction in nervous system response due to repeated exposure, right? So habituation explains how our ancestors can move into progressively colder climates while developing adapting technology at the same time. So as we move through the semester, we're going to start looking at all of these different traits, these physiological traits within humans that vary slightly between populations, but in an overall sense, function quite the same. What we refer to in anthropology, this is known as um, clinal variation, right? These are changes in things like our skin tone or blood group di distribution occur in clines, right? Meaning that there really are no distinct borders or separating marks between groups, right? The example I like to use is skin tone. It's not like you can walk walk around the planet uh, moving from Africa to Europe and all of a sudden reach, you know, the land of white people, right? It's, it doesn't work that way. What you're going to see is progressively lighter and lighter shades of skin tone, right, as a response to uh, lessened and lessened degrees of UV radiation. So clines are the changes in the frequency or percentages of an allele or feature across space. 
Clinal distributions characterize the worldwide pattern of biological variation in humans, right? So thus, there really is no reality to human races in that human populations differ. But there is a reality um, to race in terms of cultural concepts, right? So, but there's no reality to race as a set of distinct human groups with boundaries separating them from other such groups, right, in terms of biology. So it's important to remember, especially from our conversation last week about genetics, that polygenetic traits like skin color, skin tone, hair color, adult height, overall body proportions are strongly affected by the external environment, right? So for my example, right, we talk again about taking a walk from Nairobi in Africa to Stockholm, right, and looking at the variation in skin tone that we see along the way, right? You're going to notice there are real no distinct borders between those variations in skin tone. So what causes these variations in skin tone in humans? Well, it's the interaction of ultraviolet radiation and a pigment in your skin called melanin, right? And this is a brown black or a brown red pigment that is made in the top layer of the skin by these little cells called melanocytes. So in essence, what occurs in terms of melanocytes and your melanin cycle, um, in essence, the skin is exposed to UV light. That UV light reacts with a, an enzyme called 7-D-hydrocholesterol. This reaction creates pre-vitamin D, and pre-vitamin D rearranges its structure to form vitamin D. And we're actually going to talk about why vitamin D is so important. So melanocytes produce melanin in a response to UV radiation. In essence, what the melanocytes are attempting to do, or what the melanin in, or the skin pigment in your skin is attempting to do, is it's attempting to prevent uh, ultraviolet radiation or too much ultraviolet radiation from penetrating into the skin, right? So their function is to let just enough ultraviolet radiation to uh, stimulate the production of this enzyme 7-dehydrocholesterol so that you yourself can produce vitamin D, which is an extraordinarily important vitamin in terms of your immune system as well as your skeletal development within your body. So in essence, I cannot um, understate the importance of vitamin D within your body. So in essence, we talked about last slide how vitamin D or melanin within your uh, skin is a response to ultraviolet radiation because you want just enough of that ultraviolet radiation within your body to produce enough vitamin D in order to maintain homeostatic functions of your various systems, right? So you can see in this slide that having a vitamin D deficiency causes all sorts of effects on different systems, right? We have, it can cause type 1 diabetes or lead to type 1 diabetes. Uh, we have rickets or osteoporosis affecting your bones. You can have aches and weakness in your muscle, muscular tissue. It can lead to high blood pressure leading to coronary heart disease, right? So there are all sorts of conditions that you can be more susceptible to because you have a vitamin D deficiency. So this is where we really see our variation in skin tone, right? It is an ancestral adaptation to the levels of ultraviolet radiation that are present throughout the earth. If you look at the image above, right, this is the ultraviolet radiation map of our globe, right? And you can see that the UVR is most intense near the equator. And we can overlay that map directly on top of a map showing skin tone, and you're going to notice that skin tones are darkest in regions that get a lot of ultraviolet radiation, right? Because that melanin acts as a shield and blocks the ultraviolet radiation, letting just enough through to stimulate the production of vitamin D. So remember that your skin tone is going to be an evolutionary response to the environment and will likely take many, many generations to change. But there are other factors that affect an individual's skin color, such as the transparency of their skin cells, the reflected color from arteries and veins, as well as variations within single populations of melanin production. So we all know that humans, based on our uh, analysis of mitochondrial DNA, we all know that we came from Africa. But the question is, is as we began to migrate at or around 100,000 years ago to different parts of the world, really what did, uh, um, you know, when did our skin begin to lighten? When did that ultraviolet or that lack of ultraviolet radiation really cause our skin to lighten to allow more of that UVR to get through in order to produce adequate levels of vitamin D? 
Well, we have the SLC24, a five gene, um, which changed European skin tones at or around six to 10,000 years ago. We trace back using the molecular clock uh, those mutations. We have a ne Neanderthal gene called the PCD16 gene that affected skin tone at or around 250,000 years ago for our Neanderthal species. So the moral of the story here is this changes involving skin tone and UDV adaptations are very long process, right? So it's very likely, you know, we talked about in a prior lecture, the controversy surrounding Cheddar Man. You know, everyone thought that the first British individual was going to be uh, a white-skinned individual or a light-skinned individual. Um, and they come to find out, well, based on our genetic evidence, that simply wasn't enough time in that environment for that human population, for that skin tone to lighten like that. So it was very likely their skin tones were still fairly dark, right? Because it takes many, many generations for some of these genetic changes to really cement within a population. Melanin also serves another important function apart from allowing UVR through to produce enough vitamin D, right? UVR also is very detrimental to folate. And folate is a nutrient, we also call it folic acid or vitamin B10, that is um, that we can get from food, i.e. leafy greens. It's so important, you can kind of think of it as a superhero, right? It's necessary for DNA manufacturing and many other processes within your body. And it's especially important during the development of a fetus, and it helps prevent against bad birth defects like spina bifida. So in essence, fierce ultraviolet radiation can destroy the folate within your body, right? So people in areas with very strong sunlight evolved dark skin or lots of that brown-black melanin so that that melanin can act as a shield against that uh, destruction, right? So in essence, not only does that melanin assist you in vitamin D production, it also assists in preventing ultraviolet radiation from destroying this extremely important nutrient within your body. So in essence, since ultraviolet radiation can cause folate destruction and allow for um, the ability of birth defects to develop, um, this is a very, very serious selective pressure, right? So the moral of the story here is that natural selection selected for the prevention of folate destruction because it was causing very bad birth defects. So uh, our bodies responded by changing our genetic mechanisms, which controlled the amount of uh, melanin being deposited within the skin to keep that homeostasis of folate level and vitamin D production within your body, right? So even our skin tone is a result of our body's physiology or our species' ability to use our bodies and use our genetics in order to adapt to our environment, right? So really, the reason humans vary is because, well, we have varying environments on the planet. But we do have some interesting exceptions to the rule in terms of our ultra pattern of ultraviolet radiation exposure and skin tones. We do have people living in areas with very low ultraviolet radiation that still have very, very dark skin tones, right? The Greenland Inuit retain darker skin shades. And the question that, you know, boggled researchers for many years is why did that occur? Well, we came to realize that the Inuit actually consume enough vitamin D through the fish oil in their diet to not really necessitate or not really need that lightening of the skin for vitamin D production, right? So they they essentially sidestep that selective pressure of a lack of vitamin D in that low UV environment. So they kept their dark skin because there really wasn't that selective pressure to lighten the skin to gain more ultraviolet radiation to produce more vitamin D. So this is kind of proof positive that really, in terms of humans, the only reason we have differences in our skin tone is because we have differences in ultraviolet radiation levels on our planet. And the last one we'll talk about here is lactose intolerance, right? I, I bring this up because this is a, a genotypic kind of uh, condition that uh, affects a lot of human populations, right? And think about how unique that is. Humans are the only creature on the planet that regularly drinks the milk of another species, right? Most species will have infants drink milk of you know the mother, and then that's it. After that, they move on to their adult diet, and they never drink milk again, right? Humans are the only ones that actually drink milk well into adulthood, and many humans have an inability to digest fresh milk products, right? Something that we call lactose intolerance. This is caused by a discontinuation of the 
uh, lactase, which is an enzyme that breaks down lactose, which is milk sugar. In all human populations, the infant and young can digest milk, right? We have that ability to produce lactase. And lactose is a major ingredient in milk because milk is sweet, right? That's where it gets that sweetness from. So what happens in humans is once you reach kind of mid uh, teenage years and into young adulthood, you start to actually, that gene that produces lactase turns off and you stop producing lactase and many populations become, or many individuals become lactose intolerant, right? And we all know what happens with lactose intolerance. If you consume lactose, it will sit inside of your intestines and allow bacteria to ferment and produce all sorts of nasty gases and byproducts. So in most people, the gene coding for lactase, the enzyme switches off by adolescence. If too much milk is ingested, then it ferments in the large intestine, leading to diarrhea and cramps, right? Among many African and Asian populations, most adults are intolerant milk. But we do see human populations where that gene stays turned on into adulthood. And we notice that those populations have a distinct cultural link to milk production. So if we look at the distribution of lactose tolerant populations, right, it's very interesting because it is basically uh, the same distribution as cultural dependency on milk products, right? So this must have been a factor in these populations retaining that ability to produce uh, lactase well on into adulthood. So in those populations, there'd be a strong selective pressure to shift allele frequencies in the direction of more lactose tolerance, right? Let the gene for lactose stay switched on into adulthood, right? So in the United States, who is the most lactose intolerant? Mostly African Americans and mostly Asian Americans in populations or areas of the globe where historically there wasn't as much reliance on uh, the milk products of other animals. So to recap the lecture here, remember an individual skin tone is an ancestral adaptation to ultraviolet radiation as well as folate destruction. Um, the uh, body naturally produces vitamin D as a response to UV exposure, and vitamin D is crucial for transporting vital vitamins and minerals like vitamin C out of your intestines and into your bloodstream, right? So vitamin D is very important for your immune response as well as the construction of your skeleton. Also remember our different variant adaptations to heat in various environments, right? We use both physiology as well as culture to adapt those environmental extremes all with the goal of maintaining our various levels of homeostasis as an individual and as a species.